And welcome to the Glacially Musical Podcast. My finger fudgers. Of course, it is Nick Cameron of Glacially Musical. Joined by my good friend, a man who always gets his kisses, Keefe Casanova. How we doing today, buddy? I ain't much of a Casanova. Do you know the music of Levert? Mm, I know the music of Laverne and Lenny and the Squig Tones. No. Are we, are we, am I in the same, no? Not, not even close. That's oh, fine. all right. How you doing? R&B you doing good? Fizz, though, I'm, uh, I'm hanging in there. You know, everything's terrible and on fire, but what are you going to do? We have music. Mm. Luckily, we have music. You know, you know what's great about things, you know, being on fire? We got a wall we can back up to. That like, I'm feeling good about going and hugging that wall. Okay. Take what you want okay. from that. You see my chubby? See my chubby? My big black chubby? What in the shit are you talking about? This thing right here that I'm putting Oh, your microphone, yeah. Oh, yes, microphone. That's totally what I needed for. What in the hell? Amtrak, everybody, thank you for joining us this week. Of course, if you have been here before for the Metallica, you know how this goes. If this is, if you decided that Metallica's and Justice for All is the only Metallica record worth listening to, well, I'm glad you chose this podcast. So here's how we do this. We have a greeting, we have a beer check, a vinyl check, news check, shirt check, meat of the day, which is, of course, in Justice for All. We will also be joined by a wonderful podcaster, Quinn from And Volume for All, who really thought about the name of what he was doing rather than me, who just threw two words together that really didn't go together and went, that's the name of the thing I'm doing. So here we are. Anyway, beer check of the week. Because we are having some doomy stuff, I decided to be a little doomy myself. I am rocking the Second Shift Brewing Technical Ecstasy Czech Pilsner. Does the image on the can literally have an ecstasy pill on a tongue? That's great. Uh, It is actually... uh, Yes, it does. I never noticed that before. It is a pinball machine with a mouth getting ecstasy. So, nicely done, Second Shift Brewing. Not inspired by Black Sabbath at all, though. Uh, it kind of is. I mean, a little bit. It's not like heavy riff brewing that is like Love Gun Pale Ale. That's cool. Was it good? And uh, Velvet Underbrown. And because, <laughs> and because, although the problem is, is most of their beers aren't. Although Running Riot of theirs was spectacular. Uh, and because I don't want to get up for a second one, and I got a big glass, I'm just gonna go ahead and pour out a second pint. As you do, sir, as you do. I've already been impugned, so I'm just going to go ahead and lean into the impunation. Impunation is a good word. Guess what I have today to drink? A liquid death mountain spring water. Thirst murdered. That's it. Cherry obituary, my last can. So just pop it and lock it. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. That is crisp and delicious. Uh, I'm going to move on into my vinyl check now. Uh, as you may know, I am a fan of fans of blues. I'm not the biggest blues fan in the world, but I love people that loved original blues and then like made other music that's similar, but not just like that. So I'm going to bust out the black keys turn blue. Got it on Amazon for about 20 bucks. It's just a black one, nothing fancy. So I'm going to move on to number two. Number two is previous Department of Metal Antiquities subject, Phenomena. Anybody who listened to that episode will know what Phenomena is. It is basically Black Sabbath from 1987 without Tony Iommi. Because you know what? That is so on brand for me to purchase. That is just like, okay, that is ready. Nick is ready for that. You just go ahead and you... And then it's just, it's just, it's just kind of bad, but in a really... In a really fun way. So it's like Black Sabbath with no riffs. No riffs whatsoever. Fair. I mean, that's fair. Uh, I definitely expected you to go, Menomena. Do, 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 do. Menomena. Come on. Do, do, do. You, I don't want to be. I, I don't want to be hyperbolically. Oh, what's the word? Predictable. Those two words fair. don't go together. Uh, if you say things enough, they just become true, like uh, some of our politicians out there. Is that your full check? Do you have a three for? I'm doing a two for. I got a. I have not okay. been going crazy lately, so I kind of gotta keep it back to a normal, normal spot. I, 
I do feel like you're on our theme of blues. Like you said, like you sort of alluded to a theme of lately, a lot of blues checks, a lot of blues artists or blues related, bluesy. I, I love blues adjacent. Blues like I'm not a big fan of the, um, the, the Delta blues, the Robert Johnson's, those kinds of guys. Although I got some of that stuff. I really like electric blues. And I like electric rhythm and blues, which rhythm and blues is not what most people today think of. It's more like B.B. King. B.B. King is Chicago rhythm and blues. It's not really Chicago blues. And I, I love boogie blues. I don't love, you know, like Lead Belly or uh, although I do love T-Model Ford, who is a modern blues artist who we lost at age 90 something because he doesn't know when he was born. Didn't How know about born. Uh, Taj Mahal or Kebbo? I have not heard either of them. There was uh, a blues artist I saw at um, the Bottleneck Blues Bar at the Ameristar Casino whose album I bought, unfortunately no vinyl, one of the last CDs I ever purchased. It was $20. It was pretty good. Um, not spectacular, not amazing. Uh, a record I sent you a number of years ago is very blues-inspired. The... Uh, God... <laughs> My brain is not working. The test pressing I sent you, it's Global Soul, Thomas Donker, and Sam... Someone. I really should have thought this through before I started speaking. But yes, I do love blues adjacent and, and later blues. I don't love the, the earlier stuff. I, I asked earlier, I mean 30s. Question. Yeah, I get it. That's actually the stuff that I like, but I like... Yeah. Um, so I have an interesting twofer. I wasn't planning to do a twofer, but I had checked something on my other show, and I wanted to check it here because it's so cool to me. But uh, last week when I said that I was done with Record Store Day Black Friday 2023 releases, I lied. I still have one more. I'm surprised <laughs> you don't have 10 more. I, I'm pretty sure I you should, got them I all. I probably have 45 more. I, uh, when you well, finish, ever... it's going to be Record Store Day 2023. <laughs> Wait, we've already yeah. passed Record Store Day 2024. Heard, well, there's two Record Store Days, at least, sometimes a third. Yet to year. come. Yet to come. So this is a cool one you will like. This is, and I remember you were like, no, I'm not going to buy that because no. And this is the debut album from Gore Side Project, x Cops. Look at this thing. x Cops Ooh. reissued on vinyl by Brutal Planet Records. Um, kind of an underground band. Um kind of a party and joke band a little bit uh there's a cover of highway star on here uh wow uh i just want to hear is. that i want to you hear want it. i want to hear michael bishop sing highway star don't you i do um very much so oh uh, uh he is blothar yeah he, well theoretically he is blothar he was formerly uh beefcake well when i cover guar next month for you i will scream highway star highway star highway star and see what happens well, that's better than screaming free bird. Uh, this also has a beautiful insert that I don't think the original came with, but a photograph and credits and beautiful lyrics to all their songs that I never knew. Uh, X Cops basically a hardcore, mostly a hardcore punk rock act. Um, did come with the. Uh, it's already been played. It's been in the mylar. And the sticker has to say Gore on it. Members of Gore because. Well, you know, yeah, the um, Death Piggy record store day release also said you know Dave Brocky of Gore. It did indeed. It did indeed. Limited run vinyl, and it's a police siren red. So look at the color on this. This is, this is redder than the red on my shirt. Shout out, shirt check coming up soon. Um, this is pretty goddamn phenomenal. I gotta tell you, Pol police police red. That is the same the... color of my as my uh, Street Super Social Club album. And I like the the label is. You know, I'm pretty sure the original didn't have this label. Very so. cool. Very cool label. And now, so for the second check, this is a little random and not in order, so I apologize. But um, a while back, I was uh, house-sitting in my former town of Sassoon Fairfield in northern, not northern, I mean northern California, yes, but outside of the East Bay, outside of the East Bay. And there's a record shop there that I really like called Retroactive Records that I've done some posts about and checked some vinyl from. Um, and it was recently bought by new owners. It's had several owners over the years. The longtime owners wanted to retire, and it's a, it's a record shop and retro video game place. So it's also like a museum to old video games. They have tons of old game systems and tapes and games and accessories and records. So it was bought by a school teacher who is from Oakland, and his family relocated, 
uh, for school, for better schools, uh, which I, which tracks. And he had a lot of stuff in there, and I wasn't quite shopping to shop. I was just shopping to check out the new owner and see what they had done with the place. And I saw this, and I was like, I need to have this. This is a 7-inch single from Devo, who I love, of their cover of Secret Agent Man. And you know that Devo does covers their own way, and they make them theirs, right? We talked about this. And so... Um, this was put out on Virgin, Re Virgin Records. Originally, Secret Agent Man is a spoof song about James Bond from the 60s. It was famously covered by The Plugs in Spanish on the Repo Man soundtrack, Hombre Secreto. And uh, this is un this is just, I could not believe that, that they had this. And I think he sold it to me for like 10 bucks, and I bought it. And it's got the classic Virgin Records red and green, lo uh, you know, red and green logo on it. And, um... I love Devo. He had some other pricier original Devo, Devo presses I could not afford. But uh, he does have, he did like carry, he bought the entire store and their stock. So he has, you know, that place is a place you would like. They have cut, special cuts and significant, interesting, you know, expensive stuff, but also discount stuff, a nice metal section, great classic rock and jazz section, and a hip hop section. Not a lot of, they will not have like record store day stuff, I don't believe, but they, you can get anything else there. There is also a uh, parody of that parody called Secret Asian Man by Storm and someone that were big uh, Bob and Tom show regulars. Uh, I have listened to the Bob and Tom show in over 20 years, and I'm very glad I don't anymore. But I did learn of some really good comedians from that show. So I, I don't know that who that they are. Is that St. Louis? Is that St. Louis thing? No, it's uh, it is Midwest. They record out of Indianapolis, I believe. Fair enough. News check but time. News check. I got one short one. Just Kiss is now getting ready to celebrate the 35th anniversary of quite possibly their worst record. Which is what, Keefe? What record am I talking about? Almost certainly you're talking about Hot in the Shade. Oh my God. Definitely why? Hot in the Shade. Why? Why would you do this? Why would I do? Why would I bring this up? Or why would they celebrate this thing? Either, either. See, this either. album has fourteen or sixteen tracks. I don't know. All I know is I am thirty or forty years old, and I do not need this. And this album could have been released on a seven inch. And I'm being generous. You could add forever on side one and rise to it on side two, or you could have had forever disco edit on side two. That Forever album written, written or co-written by Michael Bolton, no? Uh, Michael Bolton or uh, Jean Bouvier or uh, God, who was the other guy they used a lot? Kim Fowley. Kim Fowley. No, they they did not. I think so. In the seventies, he's got Kiss credits. That's how he had his riches. No, the guy that was with John Bon Jovi all the time, the bass player. Uh, I know who you mean. But they they used crap tons of like pop songwriters and yeah. Glenn probably Ballard. Won't. Yeah, I'm sure one of them is on it, but that album is just, just terrible. So get ready to spend $200 on it for some reason, because you hate yourself and you just want to... You're basically Kevin Bacon in Animal House at that point. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Kevin Bacon is great, and uh, it's the second mention of Kevin Bacon in two weeks. I will say that Kiss fans easily kiss fans who collect their vinyl and stuff. Are surely awful. hate... Well, they're not awful. They hate themselves more than anyone else. So maybe they're not awful. They're suffering, and they need a hug. Well, you know what? If they're refusing mental help, if they're refusing treatment for their illness, then yes, they are awful. I mean, I'm going back into therapy next month. I'm going to get get right again, and, you know, take care of yourself. Don't buy Hot in the Shade six times. If you buy Hot in the Shade more than once, if you bought it once and thought to yourself, I need to spend money on this again... Get into therapy. Fair. Completely I said fair. What I said. Um, is that your only news check, or do you have more? That is all I got this week. All right. Speaking of buying things multiple times, I have several quick news items, and then we're going to bring in our guest. We're going to sure check and then bring in our guest. Speaking of buying things multiple times, Mastodon, a band Nick does not like, but we're going to cover soon. 
You keep Spoiler like throwing alert. out all these bands I don't like. Oh, Nick, we're gonna do a series of all these oh, bands for all twelve right. weeks. We're gonna do every album they have. I swear to you, um, you're gonna end up loving them if I if it kills me. I hope so everybody Mastodon, has enjoyed the Glacier Musical Podcast for the three Ma- years we've Ma- been doing it. Mastodon's best record, arguably, is "Crack the Sky" from 2009, celebrating 15 years. I have two versions of this record and the live album where they performed it in its entirety but they have remastered the entire album they're putting it out in a gigantic package and it can be yours very soon out from reprise records do um, not worry anyone out there i will not be competing with you for one of these very limited edition and i'm sure surely very reasonably priced yeah i can't really I lo- i'm gonna listen to it but i definitely can't see buying a third set of this thing i love that there's only one and, album i bought that many times and that's the wall yeah well that's different and anything from the 70s is a different story entirely especially with the, the variations and the quality uh metallica still on tour i checked the set list before this show nothing new or unusual so we're just going to pass right by that interestingly enough i was served an ad today because i was listening to injustice for all on spotify and Fleming Rasmussen is doing like a master class series on album production. Now, I don't remember the last album he's actually produced of merit. And he might not have worked in all his time since he stopped working. You know, he's done other records. People used to go to work with him because of Metallica. Certainly not for the sound of this record we're going to do today. But he's, nope. if you want to pay a lot of money and meet Fleming Rasmussen and get taught by him how to produce records that hopefully sound better than it, more like Master of Puppets and less like Injustice for All, you can Google search that in the Google machine and it will help you. Last two quick news items. I saw two concerts last weekend. I saw on Friday in Concord, California at the... Uh, pavilion, the Mortgage Bank Pavilion or whatever it's called now, Toyota Pavilion, excuse me, I saw Stone Temple Pilots, The Band Live, and Our Lady Peace. And Stone Temple Pilots, the previous podcast Chaser episode album in its entirety, Purple, which is 30 years old this year, which is why Nick and I did it earlier this, was it earlier this year? Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. This spring. And uh, it was marvelous. Uh, Played the whole record in its entirety, went off stage for a brief breath of air came back out did an encore of some of their uh some greatest hits and deep cuts and exited it was a pretty great hour hour and 20 minute set from them live is basically just the singer and he's fired everybody else um but wonderful throwing copper is the record they're celebrating with their most their best known incredible mm-hmm. record you're not a fan lawyer wife is a huge fan so if they come to town and i notice i'm gonna have to buy tickets and I'm going to text her right now. It's going to be a lovely day of (laughs) self-flagellation. Oh, you, the tour is great. And Our Lady Peace is fun. They did a brief set and maybe played all but one of their big hits. So, a very good one, two, three. I'm seeing the Doobie Brothers this weekend for her. That's cool. I guess. How many Doobies do you be, do they do? How many Doobie Doos do they have? Are we talking about Bud Light and the Penguins? Or where where I don't, I got lost here. Do the brothers have how many members that are actually? I don't know. They got like they fifty do, people in that do, band. Do they, is Michael McDonald back? Isn't he dead? No, bro. It's horrible. Are you sure? Yeah, man. Come on. I'm not. I I'm not Michael kidding. Michael McDonald, well alive, well alive. Stop it. Oh, you're right. He is. No, he's not that old. He's only seventy-two. He looks like Barry Bostwick. A little bit. Like not like Barry Bostwick in, when they were in, young. In, in Spin City. Barry Bostwick. Yeah, I mean, like boxing. old Barry Bostwick. And he also kind of looks like George Lucas in this other one. How, how gorgeous is Carla Gugino still? Oh, my God. I don't know anyway, who that is. I weep for you. Uh, anyhow, second concert of the weekend, and the sanctity of my news check, please. Uh, the second concert of the weekend for me was uh, System of a Down and Deftones in Golden Gate Park with support from um, the Mars Volta, who I had not seen in 20 years, and they were great. Never uh, seen, would love great. to. Yeah, they were surprisingly great. Uh, and the Viagra Boys and Vows, who I missed the beginning of because it was tough getting in. Uh, wonderful show. 50,000 people came out. This is the hors d'oeuvre to the fact that there's going to be a all-summer concert series in Golden Gate Park next summer. And it will probably be this, whatever this was that was System and Deftones, will be like the rock metal weekend every year. And so I've been told it's coming back for a... A multiple day festival and that was pretty great deftones cut their set a little short and system played a little longer 
as a result were just about the right amount of time and it was fantastic they played deep cuts and some cool things I was not expecting both bands to do um, and that's all all the everything should we take a brief pause and bring in our guest what do you think uh, I'm real quick I'm just gonna point out that uh, the Doobie Brothers officially have three Doobie Brothers in the band however I don't see that any of those dudes are touring so who the hell are these people? And with that, we will bring in our guest. <laughs> I I have nothing to add to this, but I want to laugh anyway. You're supposed yes, to pause. pause now. I know. Gosh, I'm oh. hit hit the button. Alrighty, we just wasted gold on nothing. It's a hugely funny joke that's only funny to him, him, and me. I know. I know. God damn it, anyway. Anyway, we are be thrilled and happy to be joined by someone who thought about the name of their podcast, who's like, wow, I could do something clever. Unlike that Nick guy who just thought of something really stupid in 2012 and is just never letting go of it. I mean, what the hell does Glacier Musical even mean? I don't know. You know what? It's, I was going to ask you that. I was actually going to say, like, what is what does glacially musical mean? Uh, originally, it was when I was really poor, and it was the whole thing started as a blog where I was just writing about the CDs I purchased. However, I didn't have any goddamn money back then, so I mean, this is back when my in-laws were giving us like you know grocery gift cards for for Christmas, right? And uh, yeah, now lawyer wife is is a boss lawyer wife. So I mean, it's we're fine. I'm I'm buying steak and fancy tomatoes and cans and shit. But you call uh, her lawyer lawyer wife so as to distinguish between the other wives? No, I call like her okay. Fishing wife, and there's like a. All right, Quinn. Nobody's ever asked this goddamn question, and so now now we have a journalist among us who's getting to the nitty gritty. <laughs> I refer to her as lawyer wife, so I don't come across as I am so rich and powerful. Got it. I do it to actually undercut myself. Yes. Like I am afforded this lifestyle because of lawyer wife. You're the Doug Emhoff of the relationship. Oh my God. Yes. Except I cook really well. Oh, okay. Uh, except I can't seem to do brown rice. My uh, wife can't do rice or coffee. It's the, I can't cook, but she cannot do rice or coffee. For some reason, those are my two. That's what I'm relegated to. Those are the two things that I do. For some reason, I cannot time brown rice. Brown rice in my house takes 90 minutes. I don't know what the hell the problem is. I can do white rice like nobody's business. Uh, I cannot do Spanish rice. Working on that. I'm also perfecting salsa. Ooh. I feel like I'm missing one ingredient. I'm almost there. But uh, anyway. I, I don't have a partner, so I have people I hook up with, and then I do the walk of shame home in the daylight with my sunglasses on. And make cook. I cook for myself, and like a single mom, I eat over the stove like I'm like an idiot. <laughs> and we, you, anyhow, you, you we actually that. eat at the table oh, now, yes. and I hate it. But I'm oh, not no. going to tell my family that, and they don't listen to this because I mean, why? I mean, they they get to hear me pontificate every day. They don't they don't need this extra ninety minutes a week to hear whatever the hell's going through my stupid brain. My uh, wife actually said to me the other day, she was like, I want a really good podcast. So I did a series on World War One, like music, uh, World War One through heavy metal, because there's a lot mm -hmm. of metal. that. Yeah. Goes. And she was like, you know, I really want a good podcast on World War One. And I was like, yeah, if only someone would make that in a way that was accessible, oh. that you might be interested okay, in. Okay. Somebody I, who knew you and she doesn't listen to the podcast. Got episodes. you beat. I, I got you beat on that one. And I have never spoken about this publicly, but I will now because I feel like you forced me into it. I did. Um as a gift to lawyer wife because she likes books on tape she likes it when i read to her that was actually something we we bonded over was the there was one night she was very very sick when we were dating so i read firebird by mercedes lackey to her if you want to get some deep cuts of russian bullshit, there you go did not see that coming up this week but here we are so i made a podcast for a party of one oh. and i won't give the name of it so nobody can find it and do I hear, read. Do you want to hear about my failed podcast, Nick? Can I can I can I finish? Can I have the sanctity of my story? <laughs> yeah, we can. want to maintain the integrity. Yes, continue. Thank you. There's sanctity no of the story. Here. Barely any. Uh, so I did this entire. I read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, chapter by chapter. Wow. And she never listened to it. Well, at least he didn't put any effort in. 
She's like, oh my god, thank you for doing that. I, you know me. And I'm like, yeah, you yeah. Sh you should have you done Lord of the Rings. Uh, I have the Hobbit here ready to do. So my oh, fail oh, podcast, oh, right he here. has, it ready. Right he here. has here. it ready. He had it ready, this guy. Um, much like a, oh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. I was going to make a casino reference, but um, I was going to try to do a KISS podcast before Nick and I started, before I joined Nick's podcast. And I was trying to call it Pot of Thunder, but there was already a podcast called Pot of Thunder. Yeah, and it yeah was I know so the good. guy that runs and that one. They were so good, I canceled my KISS podcast idea. Oh, no. Yeah, some, of the one pod, of those... some of the KISS podcasts are pretty good. Let me say, since thank you for bringing that up, because you know, Quinn almost made me shut this shit down. Because Quinn does this like same kind of concept that we do, very similar. He's got characters. He edits and stuff, and he writes things down. And I'm like, wow, that is so professional. I well, hate that, you and love you at the same time in a way that I don't like. I understand. That's how my family feels, and I really appreciate that. Um, it is. I do. I, I do sometimes get into the middle of a script, and I'm like, what? why am I working this hard? But it, ultimately it comes back to the same reason we all do music podcasts. Cause you know, we love the music, right? We love this. We love talking about it. We love arguing about it. We love making our lists and checking them twice and, and uh, you know, uh, figuring out what, you know, uh, the, the long version of what the greatest flotsam and jetsam albums are from top to bottom. You know what I mean? Like, um, that's just it's, kind of it's obviously doomsday for the deceiver. I mean, I don't think we need to do a series on that to figure that one out. Well, you know what? Maybe we could create another failed podcast. That's another failed podcast. I'm, right I am there. ready. I am ready. To, I am ready to court divorce, and I'll do a third one. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I do love that band more than you can imagine. Um, hey, Quinn, really quick before we dive into Metallica stuff, sure. and a and ask you about your podcast. What? What? Do you have a fun shirt on? You can share because we never shirt check today. I do. I put on a shirt. I put on a, a shirt. Let's do your new shirt check. You know Elder? Music from I the know Elder? Them well. No. It is Elder, the band Elder. They're opening for Tool now, I think, actually. Oh, I saw them, um, and Keefe, you will appreciate this being a New Yorker. I saw them at St. Vitus. Oh, my uh, God. How did you know Keefe was from New York? He never talks about it. Oh, yeah. You know what? I just had a feeling. Real quick, he also went to Fame High School. Uh, lived in Boston for I think eleventy-seven years. Wow! And uh, once sang with Whitney Houston. I, I don't know if you've heard any of these stories. I have I, not. I mean, I, I I had knew I had known the New York thing. I did not know Whitney Houston. That's... Nick Cameron is my official biographer now. Um, <clears throat> what okay. year was that? Oh, yeah, because you know, Keefe is now officially the duck of death. <laughs> And I'm the biographer. Which which year did you see Elder at St. Vitus? Because I might have been there. I saw them. Um, oh, God. It was when I was in New York. When I lived in New York, it was toward the end. So it had to be somewhere around 2016, maybe? Uh, I, I think I had, yeah. 15? I think I had, I had just moved back and I didn't get to that show, but I saw them another time in Brooklyn, but I saw every other show at St. Vitus from 2017 to 2020 without, like, literally five days a week I lived there. Love that space. I loved it. Yeah, it was me, so cool. Bro, that's so sad. The bassists, um, uh, amp went out in the middle of a song. They're in the middle of a song. And if you know Elder, Elder has very lengthy songs. Um, and they, they were, all of a sudden the amp goes out, and I can see him looking at the other guys, and, and the other guys are like, they, they just sort of nod to each other and they start jamming. And the, the bassist takes the thing off, takes the, the whole guitar off, sets it down, goes over, finds another amp, plugs it in, plays it, doesn't work. They're still jamming, still jamming. I mean, they're like right in, they were like right in the middle of a verse. And so he takes it off again, puts up another amp, plugs this one into the amp. This is maybe like a full minute and a half or something like that. Plugs it in, looks at the other two guys really quick, boom, right into the stroke. I mean, like, like, clockwork i have never seen anything so impressive of course we all went fucking nuts because it was like it was so cool to see and they were just a great band and i got to meet nick uh you know he sold me this t-shirt that so. is that's a much cooler story than when i saw the toadies and the bass player <laughs> broke a string uh, i should mention that this little woman and i swear to god she was like four foot six 
I mean, just this little thing, playing a Rickenbacker bass. She only played the E string, so she breaks the E string. So what does she do? Just moves down to the A. It's a lot like when I saw Guitar Wolf and uh, Seiji handed his guitar to some dude in the crowd. If I had closed my eyes, I never would have known. Much wow. like when he broke three strings at once. I, it's just, it all sounded the same. But we could sit here and we could tell story after story, and I'm going to do my shirt check. God damn it. Uh, my shirt check is I love kitties and beer, <laughs> which is very on brand for me. I have five cats. Great band. Great band. Yes. I like them. I like it before they did the electro pop. I mean, I like, you know, obviously their classic era, you know, their gate kept era is the best era. When once they went mainstream on skateboard records, it just it just went to hell. It just went to hell. Yeah. New producer. Nick hit fish, the, hit fish. Always with the puns, Nick. I am wearing a shirt by a Los Angeles metal band Void Vader. Um, and uh, I have no other notes. They're pretty good. Um, so many questions, but Quinn, why don't you? I'll shut up for a minute. Why don't you give us the elevator pitch for your podcast for those that don't know who you are? Great. Um, I do a podcast. Uh, my elevator pitch is the one that I start out almost every episode with, uh, and it is that I. Uh, this is and volume for all a deeply reverent and lovingly irreverent exploration of the history, philosophy, and future of the greatest music in the world heavy metal. So that is what the podcast is. And it's sort of developed over time. I've done different things with it. You know, I do, I've done a couple of interviews I've done, but mostly, um, I don't know if you've ever listened to the podcast, um, Hardcore History with, uh, you know, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. I really, really fell in love with his, um, his, uh, Blueprint for Apocalypse, which I think was the World War One. And I was like, I want to do that, but I want to do it about music and with jokes. So that's what I do is is I try to ape Dan Carlin. Um, but I also have added in the fact that, you know, I'm a voice actor and and I can do silly impressions and, uh, you know, m m some good, some. The other impressions and uh, I, I'm a big fan of Nawabum. I love him. Oh yeah, I, oh, I he when he comes on, I actually have a picture of that dude in my brain. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he he's wearing a red bandana totally. and dark sunglasses down to his nose because he's and he's got like he, he's got a cigarette butt, not even like a whole cigarette, but just a cigarette butt in his hand, and he's wearing one biker glove on one hand. Absolutely, and he's wearing absolutely blue jeans and a sleeve a red sleeveless t shirt. That's dirty. It's got like oil stains on it. Not because he has a motorcycle because he can't afford one, no. but because he's been near one six months ago and his girlfriend kicked him out and he doesn't have, he, he doesn't have 60 quid or I'm sorry, 60 pence to go to the laundromat. I, I sort of feel like you read the backstory that I wrote and that's a little disconcerting. Uh, I'm an English major. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Good. Give me your analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Nawabum. Nawabum just sort of came up because I think it was like Pantera or something. I was talking about the Pantera albums and how um, Anselmo is doing like on Cowboys from Hell, you can hear him doing the like, wow, you know, like really. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like all of a sudden the Nawabum just popping in to say, oh, you guys are doing a song about a motorcycle. No. All right. See you later. You know that. And that was it. And then. Wunnawabam just sort of developed from that. I started doing Lemmy by accident. I started doing Dave Mustaine by accident. And now they won't leave me alone. But one of the things is like, Lemmy's like the Aleister Crowley of metal. He shows up everywhere. You know, I didn't, wasn't really a big Motorhead fan, but I've just become this huge stand for, for uh, Lemmy because he's- I am the biggest fantastic. casual Motorhead fan in the world. <laughs> the biggest casual Motorhead fan in the world. I believe I'm the only one as well. <laughs> Which also makes me the smallest. Yeah, you don't really get a lot of uh, waffling on Motorhead, do you? It's I don't waffle. I, I, I like Motorhead. I don't love them. If they come up while I'm listening to my on my phone, great. I don't have any of their records on vinyl. Okay, I'm all fine. And I'm fine with that. Seen them several times in concert. I actually covered the last show he played in St. Louis months before he died. Or weeks, I should say. Oh, wow. And that is the weirdest concert I've ever covered because he had been sick that tour. Oh. And so there were like four or five shows before he had played like only two of them, like finished two of them. So it was like this really weird vibe. I apologize. I'm going to shut up now. That's right. No, no, no. I, 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 hey, Nick, quick question. Who would win in a fight between Lemmy and God? 
Trick question. Lemmy is God. Lemmy is God. So so Motorhead is one of you know one of my favorite bands, and Lemmy is my religion. So we're also really Nicholas. good at quoting movies without like talking about it ahead of time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I know, and uh, I noticed that. I noticed that. Lem, and, uh, Lemmy's de- Lemmy's death has hit me actually the hardest of any rock celebrity passing. For and, me, it uh, was MCA. I, I really hope. Yeah, that was hard. I, cause, you know, I he's really from Brooklyn, I, right? He's from Brooklyn, I, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Queens, technically. Uh, oh. They were from Queens originally. So, uh, so they're from Quicklin. <clears throat> it's the same thing, yeah. right? They're not from Ridgewood. They're from. They live on the bridge. Queens. I yeah. I I deeply hope that I um. Die before Ozzy. Anyway, um, <laughs> to get heavy for a second. Oh my Nick, God, Nick, let us uh, set up the episode. We're I am actually the whole good. album. I, I'm not going to give my normal setup because oh, no. one, I'm having performance anxiety because I feel like Quinn is better than me, so I well, don't stop. want to. But the real reason is because um, I'm 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 being demure. But I feel like we're gonna like really shoot some ropes on this one, and we're just gonna finger fudge this record from from top to bottom. Yep. And so I'm and there's not a whole lot change between Master of Puppets and. And just for all the biggest difference, what is the biggest difference, Keefe, between Metallica in 1985 in Reykjavik uh, Burrito Studios in Denmark versus Metallica walking into one-on-one studios in Los Angeles? None of what you said is true. Um, I, obviously, they went to the Reykjavik whole... Skating Rink Studios in Denmark, right? No, did I make something up again? You did. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. No, I don't Re- remember the Re- name of the studio. Reykjavik is in Iceland. No, Denmark Reykjavik is, is another definitely, country. Reykjavik is definitely not the capital of Iceland, and they definitely don't have a Honey Week. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's a money. That's a deep Monty Python reference. Just really if anybody didn't pun. get it. Yeah, we did a whole series on Monty Python, by the way. Great series on Monty Python. Even though John Cleese is abhorrent to me now. Um, he was great at the time. He was great at the time. He was great at the time. He's terrible now. So. He's we, old just did a whole, we just did a whole, he's beyond confused. We just did a whole episode on the death of Cliff and the aftermath of the death of Cliff and how right. Cliff's death changed Metallica's entire trajectory. And just as for all might not have even ever happened or sounded like it did, it would definitely be, the Black Album would have come much faster and been much more commercial and less metal than anything. I'm just going to point out, that was Keefe's point. <laughs> That's my philosophy. Nick thinks and I that nodded while guy. he talked. Nick, I didn't Nick, say that that was Nick, true. Nick thinks Lars should have died instead of Cliff. But anyway, what the one of those fudge? Guys. Thanos was right. Thanos was right. Um, but I think, yeah, that's just I'm giving my personal opinion. But I think. All right. Okay. Been, uh, Since okay, nobody think. understands the question, so nobody got the assignment. The, and obviously, it's not Cliff versus Jason because that would be really in poor taste. Right. The biggest difference is when Metallica walked into. That studio in Copenhagen, the Chewing Tobacco Studio, isn't that where Copenhagen Chewing Tobacco comes from? No? No? Okay. Uh, Snoo Snoo Studio? Anyway. Snoo Snoo, that's correct. I, Daffodil Studio, I believe. Daffodil. Daffodil Snooze. Heidi Studio. Heidi, Heidi Daffodil Studio. Mm-hmm. That sounds about right. So when they walked in there, they were a band that had to prove themselves. They were somebody that... Because, you know, at, at any given time, a recording contract, especially on a major label like Elektra or yeah. Atlantic, you know, blah, blah, blah. That contract is just as valid and just as strong and ironclad as an NFL contract like the one Hakeem Butler, the UFL player of the year, offensive player of the year of your St. Louis Battlehawks signed with Cincinnati. Uh, he could actually get kicked to the curb without getting a dime. Break his knee, yeah. Like last season. Last season, he twisted his knee, and he didn't make a dime on his $900,000 contract. So he had to come back to St. Louis, play for the, the, the minor leagues. If he does the same thing in Cincinnati, it's going to be the same thing. It's that ironclad. So they had to go in, and they had to make a record that really crushed it. So they went back to Denmark. They went back to their familiar confines, and they went back to their same engineer. They went back to Fleming Rasmussen. And they did it again, except they took Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning is the basis. The If you look at, you know, the fast song, the title track, the dirge, the ballad, you know, speed it up, side two. That That's basically the, the shadow formula 
of right. the Metallica record, the 80s. But they yeah. go back in to the same studio, same producer, same everything, and they kick out Master of Puppets, arguably the best record they've ever done besides Lulu. I will fight you. And I, I have it on vinyl. I have Lulu I, on vinyl. I had to buy it from England. You're the one. A, a warning for you is that uh, Southwest Airlines is having a $29 sale, and I will literally knock on your front door and punch you out if you say that ever again in my presence. Like, stop Lulu. standing Lulu. I, hate I will it. not. I will I not. So that much. album is a... Ask Duncan. Ask Duncan. It, I know. It gives me the ick. I'm going to ask... No. I'm going to ask my table how it feels about Lulu. No, you know what gives me the ick? Lou Reed on heroin, methamphetamines, and quaaludes trying to sing heroin. You would think that if he's on the heroin, it would come out great. Doesn't it's work that way. It's a song about it. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. No, it didn't. It, that's what gave me the ick, and I wish I hadn't bought that record, but I did. It's eight bucks I'm not getting back. Where was I? May I continue uninterrupted? Sorry, our, our apologies. No, I, I, I obviously I cannot, and that's fine, because I'm not going to let anybody else. So they now walk into one-on-one -on -one studios, which becomes their home base for a while. But they're not walking in as that seventh-pairing defenseman trying to make the hockey team. They are not a walk-on trying, hoping to God they get sent to the practice squad. They are not Tom Berenger in Major League hoping not to get sent back to Mexico. They are walking in the conquering champions. They are the MVP, arguably the MVP of Electra Records at this time. So they are able to go in and record. And as Keefe has pointed out, whenever we've talked about Metallica, they write con consequential, sequentially, excuse me. They write sequentially. So they already started on the record when they got there. They bring in Fleming Rasmus, and this time he has to leave the the friendly confines of the the European Union, and he has to come to America. He has to come to Los Angeles, and God, that must have been a culture shock for him. I can't even imagine what that would be like going from, you know, although he was in Berlin and, you know, they're in the Cold War, so that's probably kind of, maybe it wasn't that much of a culture shock now that I think about it. Probably a lot of iron bars all over both places. Uh, I rescind that statement. But they are able now to record with their chosen producer in their backyard-ish. Not even in their backyard, but they have to go uh, six, four hours south. But they are able to get the label to pay for all of this in a way they had never before. And the real issue now is uh, we got to look over at that guy that's not Cliff. Yep. And as we discussed last week during the Master Puppets, or during the during the uh, Injustice Garage Days re revisited episode, they did not go to therapy, discussed going back into therapy myself, get my mind right, get everybody's health right, be in charge of yourself. They did not have that. They had Jägermeister. Yeah. And Jägermeister is not necessarily the best therapist. It doesn't, it's not conducive to mental I, health necessarily. No, I don't really feel like it's going to get you to work through your feelings mm -hmm. as much as it is you push down the feelings and then it get, gains interest. And so, Metallica. Way, just, to just to interrupt for one second. Garage mm -hmm. Days Re Re celebrates a birthday today. Does it? Timing. Timing. As Timing. We Look at that. Somebody I'm talk to taking a drink. I just took down my decorations from last year. Nice. Uh, feeling with the feeling. Don't stop. Continue. Yeah. Shovel up. Curtis De Cur care of Curtis Dunlap, the greatest man in the history of the world. Uh, it, I just realized oh, you don't, don't know what the advisor. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. You don't know what shovel up is. If you, uh, if uh, 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 Keefe's friend, Curtis Dunlap from uh, some city, some fruit city on the East Coast, it's a big one, big and red, I think. Uh, grapefruit, I think, the big grapefruit. Okay. Uh, he came up with the concept of the shubalub. If you just say shubalub, 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 California, in about 30 to 45 seconds, Red Hot Chili Peppers? written a Red Hot Chili Pepper song. Totally. Absolutely. And they write themselves. Shubalub, oh. shubalub, shubalub, California. Shubalub. Now, I, I think I kind of, I actually, I think I kind of worked into uh, Weird Al doing Chili Peppers on that one. But I mean, either way, the principle is still the same. So, so it's an immutable principle. I think it works. I, it's definitely immutable. That is, that is immutable and irrepressible. 
You, it's it's, and he actually says shovel up in at least three quarters of the songs. Like says it, it's it's there. <sighs> he has problems, and I'm here to be a part of them. Uh, I, a, a quick shout out again to the Red Hot Chili Peppers being a band that apparently does not know how to write a set list because every show this tour has been completely different than the one before it, and I wish I hadn't known that. Mm. Because, like, the one time you don't want to check the set list, I did. Anyway, so one of the wonderful things they do to haze Jason Newstead, who is playing his heart out, who is trying so goddamn hard to fill the shoes of Cliff Burton, they go, mm, turn the bass down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, a little more. Mm-hmm. 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 Go ahead, turn it down again. Are you Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Turn, turn. Uh, I'm gonna need you to be the the engineer, since you do voices. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and turn that down. Oh, okay. Mm, no, no, no. I mean, can you still hear it? Um. Yeah, I can still hear it. It's pretty good. And do, do we want Do we want to hear it? I mean, do we need Do we need it? I mean, it is it is one of one of the one of the instruments on the album. Mm, yeah, go ahead and turn it down five uh, five decibels below audible. Okay, it's all the way down now. Perfect. That is exactly what we want. Nailed it. And uh, by <laughs> I'll the way, take here, my million dollars now. And here it is. And then Lars hands a guy a picture. Uh, this is like my favorite story of Injustice for All. He hands the mixing engineer a picture of his drum settings that he took in Copenhagen. So he hands him a Polaroid and he says, okay, set the, the EQ to this. To this. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> okay. And then, so then he doesn't do it. And Lars goes, mm -mm, mm -mm, that's wrong. No, to, I gave you a picture. I gave you the picture, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do it like the picture. I want, that's what I want. It doesn't sound great. No, it sounds perfect. No, and this sound, this album sounds like ass. If I didn't know better, I would swear to God, Jason Newstead was playing the bass on a distorted guitar. Which means I'm probably just hearing James Hetfield. I, I, li I like to get Quinn's take on this, but I'll just, I was going to try to save all my ire for after, because mm. I don't want to lose the fact that the songs are great, James is great. Oh, I will not, don't worry, of, I, I will not lose a, that. There's fact. a lot of things to enjoy on this, but I, I do want to say they did themselves a disservice. Fleming has been coming out a lot, I think, in pr promoting this, uh, I mentioned, uh, all, before you join Quinn, uh, Fleming Met Le Rasmussen is now doing master classes on production. I hope it's the production of Master of Puppets and not the production of this or other things he's worked on. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they a lot has been made about this. There's Injustice for Jason if you go on YouTube and I think there's a vinyl of it and you can listen to the bass put back just, in. Just going to say, Injustice for Jason is over the top. They went as heavy as Metallica went low. So it's I, kind of unlistenable. Whatever it was, whether it was their, I don't want to hear anybody but Cliff. I only, I have the sound in my head and it's just rhythm, a wall of rhythm guitar and drums. The drums are some of the, uh, by the way, which like when they recorded it, it sounded fine to them. Like Jason put all his parts on and then he put, he, he didn't hear it till it was mixed and done. And he didn't right, he hear wasn't it a part of it until that. He was not allowed in the mixing and actually neither was Kirk. And I have a whole Kirk story. I don't think Kirk part. would care. <laughs> He did care. He was oh. also surprised, and he used the word dismayed when he first heard it. So, and he was upset for other reasons. I'll get to during the rundown. But I just think like they did a disservice. In hindsight, whatever the reasoning, they should not have been allowed to make the executive decision on this. And they were up against the tour, so they rushed. This is very similar to what Anthrax did with uh, State of Euphoria. They rushed through a record. Unfortunately, Metallica's record is much better than Anthrax's record at the same time. Um, but they really did themselves a disservice on this because if this sounded like the Master of Puppets production, we'd be talking about this is the greatest album Metallica has ever made. Should point I'm out convinced. in the box set, which I, I happen to own, and actually that's how I was listening to the record today was the the vinyl record from the Injustice for All box set. It has a rough mix version of the album on CD, mm. and it is before they did all the stupid mixing. 
And I got to tell you, it's a it's a little bit better. It's it's uh it's like wow, this really could have been a truly vibrant record rather than this bone dry album. I once heard somebody describe Lars's drum sound on this as two graphite pencils on a kitchen tile. <laughs> Hard to disagree. And if you think if you go through the years, Lars and the snare really have a contentious relationship. They just hate each other and they're just trying to make each other worse. Right, like uh <laughs> like Pink Floyd. So like um it, Whoa, it, whoa, whoa. We do not besmirch Pink Floyd on this one. No, unless no, no, we're, I love Pink unless Floyd, we're talking about the Endless River, then besmirch the shit out of that. Listen, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. I love Pink Floyd, but uh, you know, uh Roger Waters and uh, David Gilmore have just basically been trying to kill each other with words for for you know decades. Ever. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, so it's sort of like that adversarial relationship, like uh, Lars and the Snare. Uh, I'm not allowed to say one of their names, so just now call them D and Jackass. Okay, done. Um, um, I just, was, I, yeah, yeah sorry, let's, 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 hear, let's hear Quinn's, let's hear Quinn. I just want to say, I will, be, I will be, I will be the Ebert to your Siskel, and I will say that I, okay, so I'm not a musician, right? And I assume you guys are, you are musicians. You understand the process. I'm a guitar that. owner. I'm a guitar owner. Right. Um, is that like a pet dad? It's like, I'm, I'm a guitar dad. I, have but, to... yeah, I, I did just book one of my most lucrative gigs, uh, which is a, has been a recurring gig for me where I make $25. Oh. And I play the most metal hymn wow. in the Lutheran songbook. Who's the lawyer wife now? Uh, still her. Okay. Right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to have to beg for her car <laughs> because I have a Nissan Leaf, which has an 84 mile range, and oh, the yeah. church is 50 miles away. I have to refill. Yeah. So if you do the math, that doesn't work out. <laughs> um, I, uh, I know that this is that's the bugaboo with this album is the bass and it sounds, you know, and it ha it does have a very dry sound to it. There is uh, it, it does not have as many levels as, you know, mass as Master of Puppets has um, uh, certainly definitely not as many as, you know, as the Black Album, which sounds you know produced pretty flawlessly. But I it does not bother me at all. I fell in love with the album the way that I heard it on CD when I was a teenager. Um, and the more and more that people have said, you know, I did that thing where I sort of flirted with, yeah, I wonder what it sounds like with bass. And I listened to it and it, and it, it, it's not a nostalgia thing. I try to remove that, you know, when I go back and listen to those albums that have been part of my life for a long time. And really, um, I think it, when you at, when, for me, when they added the bass back in, when I hear the bass added back in, there's something about the directness and the purity and the rawness of it that I then feel like to me is lost. I am not a, uh, I, I, I am not a, like I said, I'm not a musician, so I'm not able to go, oh, the, you know, the, I don't know anything about the production process. So I can't really critique that. I, do, I don't really know. All I know is that for me, albums, I track them in terms of like emotional topography and trajectory. Do you know what I mean? How this, how this Look album. Look at these $3 words over here. At this, this, this um, album that those are now, those are, I spent four full dollars on those. Fair enough. Um, four dollar words. Thank you. Um, I, they're like, like, I like to see, uh, to, to feel where the album goes and what it feels like. And for me, this album is the most direct. It's the most um, socio-political. It's the most social, socially conscious. It's the most ferociously political. There's so there's clearly so much anger that comes out of the loss that they just experienced. And um, you know, I, it to me, it, like I said, it doesn't bother me. And sometimes when I hear like you know that tone on Eye of the Beholder on the intro, you know, when he hits the riff on Eye of the Beholder, I'm like, I don't want any other sound. I don't want any other fucking sound to ruin this because it is pure crystalline fucking, uh, you know, palm muting through my face and into my heart. And I absolutely love it. 
And I'm sure that if, you know, if we had a counterfactual, if there was an alternative universe where they did have the base, maybe that Quinn would be arguing against this Quinn and then you know, there would be an epic space battle. But at this point, I, I to me, there's nothing you can do to touch this album. I think it's my favorite. Um, I love it beyond all other Metallica albums, certainly everything after. Um, but I... Ha- I've listened to Master of Puppets and and Justice for All, uh, both as long, equal amounts of time, and I am 100% a Justice boy. I, I think I have nostalgia for Justice because that's where I got on the train. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look, at, if you look at a an, a band's trajectory, a band's career as train tracks, and, you know, the, the big things as stops, yep. where you get on tends to be your nexus. That tends to be the virgins. That tends to be... Yes. And I'm just going to throw every sonic screwdriver Stargate word that I can right now because I'm, I'm feeling I feel like I need to. But that tends to be where one's nostalgia really hits. We're, yeah. uh, my vinyl track today was the Black. One, one, of the, one of my vinyl tracks was the Black Keys. My favorite Black Keys <laughs> record is my on my onboard point. What was it? What one? El Camino. Oh, El Camino. That's your first one. That's my first one, yeah. Oh. Uh, I this may shock and bewilder you like Apu trying to figure out Lionel Hutz's tie, but I went for about 15 years completely devoid of music because I believed that I had heard it all and I was wrong. Wow. Yeah. It was actually uh, black keys adjacent the black diamond heavies who were on the same label that Black Keys started on that got me back in. Lawyer Wife huh. and I went to go see Exine Cervanka and the Original Sinners, her rockabilly band, Exine Cervanka of the punk band X. And we were at the Schlafly Tap Room. This is back when I was a two-pack-a-day smoker and broke. Again, very broke. Uh, this is not long after my divorce. You know, uh, It was $3 to get in, and they gave you two packs of smokes. So lawyer wife takes two packs of smokes, hands them to me, and her parents end up showing up taking two packs of smokes and handing them to me. So I got like a whole week's worth of smoke, so I could afford a CD. <laughs> this is this is a complete true story. It was three bucks to get in. You got two drink tickets. Uh, I have had two beers during this show. I had no beers that night because I couldn't afford one. I could afford the two free sodas that I did not tip on. And I bought Black Diamond Heavies, A Touch of Someone Else's Class, produced by Dan Auerbach. Oh of yeah, the black time and heavies. Oh, yeah, oh, black keys. So, or black keys. God damn it. Anyway, so that is how and that and that was kind of like are my. You saying, are you saying all black bands are the same? Is that what you're saying? Seems like that's uh, what you're saying. I'm saying that if uh, black is to rock and metal, like Lil is to hip hop. Got it. Or young. Or young. Lil or young. Or is there a Lil Young? There should be Lil there, Baby Young. Lil Ooh Lil Lil Beezy Baby Young. Lil Beezy Baby Young. I would actually, buy that record. I would buy that record. That, that's going to be my nom de plume from now on. Also, I've seen Vanilla Ice live on. Oh purpose. God! All right, I well, it's a good talk, that. guys. All right, see you later. You, you, uh, <laughs> you and Om- you and Omar cut this. Love Vanilla Ice and his rap metal. I will um, not stop. Hey, where was I? So stop, I? collaborate, and listen. You had an opportunity right there. You missed it. I oh got it God damn it! Anyway, uh, can we just? Uh, how about instead? Uh, of that, uh, snow. They say me, daddy shot someone down the lane. I licky boom boom down. Wow, snow! In uh, you know what? You have informed me that snow existed again. I, I completely forgot about because here. and specifically you are, you are an informer. Because yes, I am, and because here come the hot stepper murderer. That no, I need Kamozi is not in this conversation. But what I will tell you is MC Sean. <laughs> MC Shan or Sean, Sean, depending on how you pronounce oh, it. Oh, the black guy that the, the black guy that legitimized it, uh, Snow. Yeah, so he that's was, what Jim Carrey uh, called it in, queen, in Living Color. He's a, he's a Queens rapper that is the rival of my favorite rapper, KRS One from the Boogie Down Bronx. Okay. So if you really want to go way back, into friend of MC Lars, KRS One. Look, look up that relationship and and the lack thereof. And we are uh, doing a uh, hip hop series at some point, and it's going to be uh, maybe next weird. Could, well, we do, we do, I think we should do the greatest West Coast of a certain time, and I think if we, I agree. Are I, I do remember. I do, do remember. I can get back on the track. I can get back on the rails. I remember where I was going. You can do this. Make the leap from the lion's head. You got it. All right. So, the nostalgia point is where you just feel it. That is 
Injustice for All was my Metallica entrance. That is where, in your know, junior high, shortest straw t-shirts, Injustice for All t-shirts, and I, the Beholder, my God, what a track. And you are just so right about that, that, that rhythm, that riff, that perfect, perfection, perfection. Could have been the opener, could have blackened and blackened and I, the Beholder, easily could have been flipped on the record. But yes, exactly like you, I don't bemoan the recording. Much like Kiss's uh, Hotter Than Hell, which was recorded stupid. Much like Black Sabbath, uh, Born Again, which was recorded wrong. When you record it wrong, it becomes different. It becomes unique. It becomes, it becomes something to notice. That's it right. doesn't, and that's what made Metallica so much better than all of the other thrash bands, especially even the big four bands, is mm-hmm. they were different. They were always different, and and Justice for All has this weird sound, and that weird sound works if you picture that sound in your head i quinn i don't know if you're like me and when you hear music it makes images in your face that you can't describe absolutely okay perfect so to me when i hear like i the beholder again mentioning that one just just jarred everything i see the cover of this album it is that it it sounds like that cover looks the kid and i have once had a conversation by once i mean like 50 or 75 times about do records sound like they look and that sound looks it sounds like it looks and it's perfection i do love i do love the rough mix because you get that alternate version and on this podcast we only accept alternate timelines from deadpool 3. We do not recognize any other timelines. Okay. Because that's lazy writing Star Wars. That's lazy writing Marvel. When 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 Green Lady died, I felt bad. And then she comes back in the next one. No. Lazy. Lazy. Did you, did lazy. You just, did you just call Gabora Green Lady? Yes, I did. I don't remember names. There are seven I'm getting, okay, there I'm are getting more, a twitchy eye like Daria's. There dead are from more Beauty Guardians of the Galaxies and Avengers than there are characters in Oliver Twist. And you know I'm right. It, yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's it's a lot like trying to remember all the Starks, you yeah, know, I, at the beginning of Game of Thrones. And I'm like, which one's the I didn't watch one? Game of Thrones. The not one. Which I can't one? remember the name of the dude that I can't even remember the name of the the name of the character that took in Oliver Twist that adopted him. Oh yeah. And I'm supposed to remember Green Lady's name? Fagin. No, Fagin was the that was the guy that 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 taught him how to be a thief. Oh. All right. All the, I can uh, think of now is the Green Lady is that episode of Star Trek, you know, with the yeah. Uh, which one? I mean, uh, the one where uh, Pike ends up being it ends up being Pike's and, wife. Oh, I was I thinking think Who Guys yeah. Destroy season three. Yeah. And delusions are uh, the Green Ladies. The blue are Andorians. Um, no, the, anyway, oh, the Green Ladies are Orions. Maybe. That's no, it's a hundred percent Orions. Fair enough, Nicholas. Sorry. How, so how, how let are us we doing move on time. Terrible. Let's move into track by track. We're just going to go right to the track by track. Let's go track by track. Let's start it off. The first track is, it'll go, uh, I I got it on Wiki. I'm fine. We know to trust Wiki 100%. uh, What pressing is that? I don't know. I have no idea. How do you not know? Do you not have it on Discogs? Do I not have it on Discogs? No. Yeah, do you not have it? I I, I don't know what it is. I bought it. How many records do you have? Uh, Maybe... 50, 40, 50. Uh, my kid has more than you. My 13 year old has more than that. Well, Nicholas you know, what? not very nice to our guests, bro. I'm sorry. That, that's that's this all right. Super, sure this is the behavior we pick on other people about. Nick just did it. Okay. Right? Whenever anybody comes on this show, I treat them like they're Keefy. <laughs> that is the Great. highest praise I can Fantastic. give. Fantastic. You know what? I miss, I, I miss my I abusive insult- dad all of a sudden. Whoa, ins- whoa, whoa, whoa. It's good. It's, it's good. I insult all my friends. That's how they know they're my friends. Bingo. I'm having a poker night. My buddy's like, oh, why are we going to invite the other guy? I'm like, nah, he won't come over anymore. Why not? I got drunk and belligerent. Now he won't come over. Well, you know what? If you come to my house when I've been grilling and drinking all day, I'm going to say stupid shit. Yeah. You're going to you're gonna talk shit? I get it. I, see, I didn't start my record collection until much later in life because um, I was traveled. Most I started mine at twenty in twenty fifteen because I that's when oh. I, I had a moment in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep because I was anxious about money probably, and I thought, wow, I have all the music I want for free, 
because I was getting 50, 60 albums sent to me a day in my email. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to buy CDs because I don't have a CD player. I'll buy, I'll finally buy records. Uh, I wish I had not done that. I know, because now you live in a house of records. No, I live in one room of records. There's about 1,500 in here. I see. Again, I started in 2015. Yeah, see, uh, that's a lot. That's a, you might be a hoarder. I no, I might be making up for my poverty when I was a child. I see. I see. Because I do have every bad and good Qu uh, Quiet Riot record. See, yeah, that's the thing. Is like I, I, I will. I only want records that I know are like my. I used. To, I used to be you. <laughs> what happened? It, what happened was, well, I went to the record stores and I went, oh, well, you know what? Maybe I don't need Twisted Sister come out and play featuring leader of the pack. But it's here. I see. And it's got to come I, home with I would, someone. I would argue no one needs that. I would also argue that point, but I had it on cassette in junior high. So it came home with me. Regardless. All righty. Rather than uh, that record, which we should all forget, let's move on to a record that we're all happy to remember. We are now going to talk about track by track. The first one is Blackened, which is, historically speaking, the first co-writing credit Jason Newstead gets. Blackened, and it, when growing up, I mean, we're not a political podcast by any stretch. We, you know, we make hints and jokes. Everybody knows where we stand. I am a very left-wing liberal. I always have been. And when I heard songs like this, I really believed that James Hetfield was the same. Oh, my God. I was wrong. <laughs> but, well, uh, I money can will still, do that. Yeah, I can get... I can get yeah, money does do that. Uh, Ice Cube voting for Trump. Ice Cube. Who... Trump is now offering complete immunity to cops. Ice Cube, you have the authority to kill a minority. Fuck the police. Okay, I don't know how you. I don't know how you get from A to B there, buddy. Oh yeah, I do. Four billion dollars. Anyway, so Blackened. This is one of those great songs. It is a great opening song for for a concert on the tour because it has that amazing backwards track. It is something that Metallica has used to okay. great effect going forward, where they start off with a recorded track that they can't really play live and then they jump into it as soon as they hit the stage yep great solo now this album is a double record it is a double record i will i will die on the hill it's got two records i'll die on the hill and it's long it's long which is great because i love I, lo I love double records if you nail it and like 65 minutes right yeah, yeah. 60 uh, i'm gonna round it up to 78 it's not even close to that i'm gonna round it up though okay so it fits on one CD. One CD holds 78. It must be 78. Logic. Uh, but, you know, Jason Newstead gets his first co-writing credit. Unfortunately, it's not a single, so he does not get any uh, songwriting royalties from this. But you know what? You got your name on a Metallica record, which is... Now, at this point, though, it's only one more songwriting credit with Metallica than I have. That's true. So I'm, I'm still within striking distance of getting, of getting there. But great song, great opener. <laughs> I mean, what what else can you say about a a, a, a and it, this is like Greenpeace on methamphetamines going to Ronald Reagan's house? Yeah, totally. This is like Slim Pickens riding the missile, like you know. Except on methamphetamines, it's it, you, you've yeah. got to have methamph. It's it's so fast. This is not it's just so normal fast. dudes. You're you're on something to get there. Yep, I remember. This is the song. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt the flow. But this is the song. No, I'm trying to be done. So take over. <laughs> my oh, trying to be done. Me too. Um, the this is a song that I remember listening to in my room, and my mom coming in and going and hearing the sound because I hadn't hadn't heard had anything else like this playing. You know, it was like before this, it was like Huey Lewis in the news. Um, yeah, that and, and um, and I remember her saying, "What are they saying?" Quinn, what it, what is what is this? What are they saying? Now, this was a hand-me-down album that I got from a neighbor, um, and, uh, and so I opened the thing and I started reading the lyrics to her of, of Blackened, and I re I remember I was reading and I got you know all the way into the shuns, you know the shun section, and I looked up and she had walked out of the room because she was like, okay, I think it was the moment that she realized that I was going to sort of know more about stuff than her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say keep talking. 
It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it, I, exactly. She knew that I was going to be like this. This was my thing. And I had a brain for it. And she was like, OK, look, they're not saying, uh, you know, they're not actually telling you to murder your mom. So I'm out of here. That was what my, my father always said. Oh, you listen to that. Kill your mom music. <laughs> well, I mean, they do say see our mother put to death. Yeah. But that is not the same thing as kill your mom. Yeah, subject matter is not advocacy, and it's a metaphor. So you know, and and that's like one of the things lawyer wife and I uh, had a because like I love death metal, I mm-hmm. love guar, I love really awful things, and she looks at me one day and she goes, "How do you listen to songs about this, about this this just awful awful things?" Mm-hmm. And uh, I should point out that my lawyer wife was a prosecuting attorney on the Murder Squad. Oh, okay. That, so she went to scenes and oh, the, the Law and Order. You seen Law and Order? She yeah. Lived, watch Law and Order with a prosecutor. It's it's a whole vibe. It, it's it's weird. But I look at her, and she's like, you know, she's got that look in her eyes. Like I got you, I got you, bitch. And I look at her and I go, How do you watch Law and Order? All that rape, all that murder, all mm-hmm. that torture. And she went withdrawn. Yeah, there are, I mean, seven, I, I, there are seven words you should not say on this podcast. Nick just said two of them. Anyway, oh, balls! I'm sorry. Um, You've never given me the list. I mean, it's, it should be. It should be at this point. We've needled each other so much over the years. I I know. never said. I've never said that first word. You though. love that. You love that. You hate and love that word. Anyway, I I'll hate just that word. No, I completely hate that word. I'll just try but to. At bring that us point in time, in. I had I had to be awful. Sanctity of my turn. Anyway. Um, Reclaiming my time. It hasn't started yet. I, I, I yield your time to myself. The right um, arm, gentlemen. Just, just really quick, there's very little I can, thank you, there's very little I can add to what the two of you have said, except to say, I think there are three songs on this album that could have been on any Metallica album before this or after. Blackened, Harvester of Sorrow, and Dyer's Eve. I'm not going to expand on those two yet, but like Blackened could have been on Master of Puppets, right? It's a classic thrash song. And uh, I don't think, I remember hearing this for the first time on tape or CD, and I don't think I remember like, oh, that's noticeably shitty. I don't think it registered because I was so excited and it was so heavy and angry. Um, After that, this vibe changes radically, especially because of the songwriting. But anyway, uh, good takes all around everybody. I think that's a good exclamation point on Black. I was reading about it. Sorry, I I don't, this is not about Black and specifically, but I was reading about it um today because i was thinking about oh i should you know probably bone up on whatever um and it, it's really interesting that, that the they the guy toby wright who was the like engineer one of the engineers he was the one who worked with jason newstead to help him create the bass lines i literally learned of toby wright's existence today Is, didn't he, I, wait didn't he work no, for allison chains yes and that's why i learned of and, his existence. and then and then kiss he worked for Alice in Chains, but the, uh, that's that's right. He he did he was a producer for them later, but he was an engineer for this. So I'm literally looking at this thing for um, Jar of Flies. I'm about to do series, uh, about to do an episode on Jar of Flies, and they talk about Toby Wright. And so as I'm reading this, I go back and I see, oh yeah, Toby Wright worked with Jason Newstead for only a day on it. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It's one of what those a things. Weird where, nexus. I know. I know. It's a, All right. a weird little coincidence. Anyway, I just thought I would point that out. Fair enough. Let's yeah, move Toby, on to Toby. Toby Wright is to Jason Newstead as karate instructors were to Finn Jones on uh, Iron Fist, the series. Oops. Go on. I don't know what that is. So moving on. Moving on to track two, which is a favorite of Quinn's. I know because he stole from he stole from this for his title, which Metallica stole their title from this from. Uh, right. Really crappy movies from the 70s, starting Al Pacino, I believe. So yeah. dot, 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 and Justice for All. You got to get the dot, dot, dots in there. Uh, Kirk Hammett writing credit. He does not get very many on this album, so it's worth noting to point this out. And this probably is the best written, best performed song on the record, though not my favorite. It has just got the perfection, the the dynamics. It, Metallica uses what they learned on Master of Puppets for this album. However, on this album, they write things more about what they care about. Yeah, They're contextualizing 1980s America, late 1980s America, which was really a hellhole. It was um, 
This is the point where America has fallen out of love with Ronald Reagan, yet somehow George W. Bo- George W. George W. H.W. Sorry, I'm too many George Bushes. George H.W. Bush wins the presidency. We go into recession, and then you know we have to begin the long-standing tradition of Democrats fixing recessions, but every, not the point. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, that, that's part of their platform every year. We're going to fix the recession that started before we got here. There, there's a reason that both Biden and Obama had to start their presidencies with the Recovery and the Rescue Acts. Yeah, same difference. And, and Clinton and I mean, everybody anyway. anyway. So it, it's a weird time in America. This is also now when I heard this for the first time and really got into it and really dug deep into this album was during the Rodney King era. Mm. And so this song really hit home for me at that time when Rodney King's, you know, uh, abusers, you know, assaulters, I don't know what the term is, are exonerated. Yeah. And. It's like, yeah, totally. Money is tipping the scales. And also, uh, if you're married to a prosecutor, it makes this song kind of weird to listen to. I bet. I mean, I, I, I just, I think it, it, and just as, so I love all my, my bands in layers. It always, I'm always like, oh yeah, that was when I first got into Sabbath. And then that was when I got back into Sabbath. And then when that's when I got into Sabbath as an adult. My and God, then I, got, I and, yeah, I feel that so hard. You know what I mean? And like this and Justice for All, the song was like a late, oh my God. I mean, this was like maybe when I was in my 20s, when I was like, oh, I ha- I just didn't, it, it just always like, it's the long song before I can get to Eye of the Beholder and One. And and now I just, I live for this song. I the The time that they take to come back into that riff, to come back into the verse, and it just fucks you in the face when it comes back so hard i can't love it more it is precisely the song they referred to and i don't know if this is what they were thinking of when james hetfield was talking about i read an interview contemporary interview in guitar player guitar world one of those magazines that i got like a a big stack of like they were playboys when i was playing guitar and he's like you know yeah we got to play this riff and then the main riff and then oh crap we got to get to this one and then get back to but we don't write by a clock and now the song's 10 minutes there you go. This it's is the this first one. one where they this is the first one where they had to chart it out. They had to like put charts on the wall and go, okay, and then we go to that riff, then we go to this riff, then we go to this riff, then we go to this riff. And later on, James Hetfield saying, I could have made four albums out of that. It's like, no, yeah, this is this song I mean, is like four times like, better. Yeah, this album is this song is like four albums worth of riffs. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like a Black Sabbath tune. It's got Why that it's many riffs. Yeah. It's actually it maybe has more riffs than Iron Man, which is insane to begin with. Uh, if you don't mind, let's move on to Keefe. Try to keep this rig rolling a little bit because I'm going to jump in like an asshole. Yeah, there's, again, um, glad to back clean up here. Um, this is the song, I think you already made this point, but I'll just make it again because I'm me. This is the song they meant to, you know, it's not only the title track because it's the title track lyrically. This is the song, when they had this record conceived, this is what they envisioned. This song, this writing, this length, this progressiveness, this recording... Uh, just the triple thick guitar riffs, you can, indiscernible bass. This is where you really can't. You know, oh, there's no bass here uh, at all. Um, and Lars is the one of the best drummers. All the people want to give shit to Lars. You want to give him all the shit he deserves now. This he was one of the greats in the world at this time. You're like top five metal drummers, top five drummers by all accounts. The drumming on this song alone is so choice. It's so perfect. Um, and the and the recording of the drum, just similar to, uh, we did a series on Robert Plant, regrettably, at one point of his solo. Only records. half regrettably. And we were talking about Robert's, uh, like the production techniques on Robert's solo recordings and the production techniques on Phil Collins' solo records ended up inspiring the entire 80s of drum recording. This inspired the entire 90s of metal drum recording. Uh, death metal. Not everything but black metal. Every other subgenre. Well, black metal doesn't count. Hits. They 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 yeah. lived in their own bubble, their own they want, whacked out. They want, make this sound, make this sound as bad as possible. Bad. Bubble. They, they, yeah. They, yeah, they want to be shitty. And I will say, because this is really, I don't really the 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 blackened. Uh, if there's a guitar solo in blackened, I guess there is. It doesn't stand out. Like seven. It's, it's good. The one main one is good, but the, the injustice is where uh, I think the you know, part of the reason Kirk has a credit. And he actually does have writing credits on four of the nine songs. But I will say, Kirk's uh, infamous uh, Guitar World magazine interview about this record is that 
they spent like 11 months making this record and the last two weeks before they had to hand it in to be mastered is all Kirk had to do the solos and he was so mad he I would, remember when he finished them he had to get on a plane to go to Monsters of Rock and he the was day so he mad. finished it to, to this day he doesn't really love any of the solos on this record because he didn't feel like he had enough time for he wrote them and plotted them and planned them like so that's the album that james was talking about when he said oh like kirk won't listen to an album because oh i can't listen because of x note i played so it's this record okay this kirk record. you're a fucking moron this record is amazing you did great but you were fast like, under pressure i'm not so, he doesn't think so i do he's wrong he can uh, be wrong and now <laughs> i defer to you okay you know what time it is now flip the record we got in two, song, two songs in, flip the record, side two. There's plenty of this. Uh, Eye of the Beholder, perfect song, I'm done. Boom. Yep. It, it's, it's so good. What can, what, what, what can you say? That, I mean, that, to me, it's that. The perfect, it's the perfect anthem for a nonconformist, or so they think, uh, 16-year-old in 1991. And that sound, like you were saying, like, does the record look like, you know, sound like it looks this like to me, I have Beholder like that is and Justice for All. That is Metallica in the eight. That is the peak of Metallica in the 80s. This is like it's so good. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I like the uh, we know not to trust the Wikipedia, but Lars is quoted in the wiki as saying like well, this was our CNN lyrics phase. We would just watch CNN on days on end to try to come up with ideas. And this was one of them. And uh, also a great uh, Twilight Zone episode title, of course, and uh, maybe the best episode of the whole series. And um, beside time enough at last. And I don't know, man. This is it's a pretty it's a pretty insane and great song. And yet, they're watching CNN to get lyrics. Yet it's, they sound it's so convincing. You know what? And that's, honestly, honestly, I feel like you know that artists retcon their shit all the time. I honestly, I hear Lars say that and I'm like, bullshit, bullshit. I don't fucking believe you. I don't believe you because like you actually, like that's exactly right. They are very convincing. And then part of the reason why I think they would say that stuff after the fact is because they got a bunch of shit for, you know, Don't Tread on Me and, uh, and the Black Album that all of a sudden it's like- They should have gotten shit for Don't Tread on Me. That song sucks. It's, it's, you know what? It sounds great. It's a wonderful song, but it is the- antithesis of everything that came before it's the absolute Thank antithesis you. it's it, they were an anti-war band in every fucking album for at least and one then song. they became dennis leary six foot hard on with a cheeseburger on top watching desert storm exactly it's fucking yeah. it's total bullshit and they're like well whoa, we were never a political band like oh yeah you were I, always yeah, political yes, i mean did you did you listen to anything you've done after ride the lightning i guess i mean after kill them all sorry if I can jump in, here's an interesting thing. And I think until until 72 seasons, they officially have never had a concept record, right? This is the first record. I can't help me if I'm wrong. I don't think they have one album ever where they have four songs arguably about the same topics. These no, are arguably like super woke, lefty causes and like very radical politics, all four of these songs. Yeah are literally, uh, you know, the ecology oh, wait. is fucked. We're, there's a whole other album. There's a whole other record of this, too, that we'll talk about where they get woke and lefty. Anyway. Sorry. See my moment. Um, none. Zero. No respect. Anyway. My new podcast is coming up soon with Quinn. <laughs> the F. Nick podcast. Anyway. Uh, go ahead, buddy. I'm okay. So next is one, which is another lefty woke you know, anti-war song, you know, it's, it's, you know, and maybe as we discussed earlier, maybe, you know, subject matter does not equal approval. However, this sounds very disapproving of what the guy goes through and, you know, knowing, you know, my, my late father-in-law, my late stepfather were both Vietnam veterans and neither one of them ever spoke a word about what they did over there. Right. And it's kind of what like one reminds me of is, is that law that, I mean, they, they both spent years on the other side of the world and they won't say what they did. Right. And so imagine having, and this is, you know, this is a world war one story. Imagine having spent at this, probably in this time, probably two or three years of there doing unspeakable things. And then you are left mute 
and paralyzed. Only your thoughts of what you have done. Holy shit. Yeah. I'm getting chills from my own words. I hope you are too. Yield my time. Now seeing that and that video uh, is so was so affecting and just the I mean, you can see sometimes even on social media, people just posting the gif of them, you know, head banging while they're playing. And it's just like it's feed it into my face. I love it so much because it, it's so it is so fucking aggressive and so brutal. And so this is fucked. And if this seems scary, if us dressing in black and shouting at you and playing really aggressive music seems scary, it, it it's only because we're so we're so enraged about what the world is right now. You know, in '88 when there were a lot of radical politics going on. You know, we call it woke now, but it wasn't woke then. And that's this is where you know hip hop's coming from too. No, back then it was militant. Exactly. Two quick notes about this song, uh, and again, the video, Metallica's first video, and we've all heard the stories, James didn't want to wear the makeup, um, it's brilliant, uh, they ended up wearing a Grammy for this song, the first ever metal performance Grammy was awarded for one a year later. No, yeah, um, Jethro Tull They lost it. it. They lost no, Jethro Tull. Oh, they were nominated, no, yeah, I don't, whatever, anyway, I keep... I don't want to keep talking about Jethro Tull. Uh, Magnetic Guy is doing a Jethro Tull Aqualung album redux, Nick. Nick is going to buy it today. Nick is Twitter. not going to buy it today. Nick is going to punch somebody in the face if they say Nick should buy that record. It has one good song and I, I, and then I, I 11 other songs. But, um, yeah, I have so I, I hate to be this guy, but I'm going to be this guy. So yeah. actual old school thrash metal fans know of a band called Dark Angel. They are from Los Angeles. They are oh, almost yes. as they are almost as old as Metallica. They're infamous for being the home band of the great Gene Hoagland of Death and Death Clock and formerly of Testament and other bands and uh, many many other bands. Omar cut this has interviewed uh, Gene recently about all his bands, and so there's the da the the pinnacle Dark Angel set album from 1986, like a year and a half before this comes out is called Darkness Descends. They recently played the whole album on an anniversary tour. And the song opens with the riff that everybody knows from one. da 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 Before the lyrics even start. Before the lyrics even start, the riff opens the album. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Keefe was doing the thrash riff. The the opening riff is dan 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 I'm talking about the the opening riff of the Dark Angel song is the thrash riff. Oh, okay, I misunderstood. They literally stole it. And not only did they steal it, he even does the ba da ba ba the offbeat. Da -da 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 -da. That's in there too. Literally on the first measure, it's that in there. That riff is just the open E string though. I don't think you can steal the open E string. I'm just, I can, I literally don't want to get demonetized. I could have literally had it queued up and imported it and played it. I'm just, I'm just being contrarian. Um, you can, there eight, well you say you're not a contrarian and I disagree. Cause I'm a contrarian to your contrarian. <laughs> I'm not a contrarian, but I can play one on the podcast on YouTube. You can. You play one on TV. So I'm just pointing it out that this has been, I mean, Metallica's been. Meta everybody you know, steals. Grafted, I mean, Stanley. Uh, whole, Make sure you steal a diamond, not they, a piece of glass. But it's Metallica's like it wasn't an unknown. Golden. Like, so in America, Diamond Head and Discharge and some of these other bands, Blitzkrieg and Angel Witch were very rarely known. And Dark Angel wasn't. I don't want maybe not a major band, but a second wave, well-known thrash metal band by all accounts. So like, it's kind of shitty what they did. I, I've heard it. I, you know what, actually, I think, I think too, Keefe, I think that if you listen to the very, very beginning of that song, it has a little bit of the beginning of Blackened to it. Like it sounds a little bit like Blackened coming in the way that it comes in and stuff. And it, yeah, they're inspired. And they okay, play. you're they, ruining my childhood. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I do not, I'm not besmirching Metallica for doing this because they, they took Man. that song and made it a lot better. Yeah, that's what Metallica does when they cover a song note for note too. Just going to point out like M Merciful Fate. I listen to the Merciful Fate medley and cry because I'm like, wow, if, Mat if Merciful Fate had a producer, mm. it would sound like this instead of, eh. anyway, let's get to disc two. Let's I don't try to. I don't want, I'm sorry, I don't want to ruin your podcast. I may have children come in here quick uh, at some point. So I just need to, uh, I, I just want to let you guys know that uh, my wife said, well, I'll be back at 645. So 
<laughs> All right, let's try to let's try to whip through disc two because my wife it. is waiting for me as well. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, track five, shortest straw. Uh, good song, not not super spectacular. Made for great T-shirts. This is Metallica doing their Iron Maiden singing about stuff that's uh, kind of like singing about the lottery, for for lack of a better term. I love it. I think uh, uh, it's a sleeper favorite for me. There's just every time the shortest straw comes on, back to that back to that simplicity of it. And the rhythm of it. And uh, there's something about, there's just something about the way that they create rhythms at this time and the way that they're using, um, that they're using, that they're using a uh, guitar. Uh, James is using guitar almost percussively that I, that I love. Correct. And it's also so minimalist compared to what they do in the aughts. When you get to Death Magnetic, when you get to Lulu, when you get to, uh, uh, hardwired when you get to 72 seasons james riffing is it's not it's to quote pulp fiction it ain't it ain't the same ballpark it ain't the same league it ain't the same fucking sport yeah and this is still true and this was so revolutionary for the time um it's also yeah keefe go for it sorry no, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, like, you know, no notes. It's uh, another, I mean, you know, if you just took the songwriting and the lyrics, this album is, is nearly, fl almost flawless. Almost. Um, well, we'll get to the flaw in a minute. We'll get to the flaw in a minute. Yeah, right. It's coming up. It's yeah. coming. Uh, next track, Harvester oh. of Sorrow. That's you want to talk part. about what should have been the single? Boom. This is, they could have played the whole song on MTV. It is an amazing riff. It's not, it doesn't have like super scary thrash. This would have broken Metallica in a way that one never could. And Wait, it's got- Technically it was a single, it just wasn't the video. Same diff. It was the first single. In, in 1989, well, if, if your single doesn't have a video, is it a single? We're still in the era where you have TBS's night tracks, you have Friday night videos, you have MTV. Their music, this is the peak time of music video. In two years, it's an MTV VH1 situation only. But at this time, you still have oceans of venues, almost as many venues to play videos on television nationwide as you do radio stations. This would have been a much better single because the subject matter is just standard metal, it's not creepy. It's not like nobody, you, you don't have to think to get this song. You don't have to think to feel it. And the riff, my God, that that is in having the bass turned way down on this song doesn't make it different. If you if you increase the bass on this one, it's still the same song. I yield it's my time. A, it's a, it's a, this one goes hard. I mean, it's, it's family annihilator shit. Like this is dark, dark stuff. And uh, I make with my, a smile every time I make I want I want people to understand why Metallica is great. I, I love these little these tiny little moments, you know, that become like the heart of something for me. It's coming back into the verse that delay on all have said their prayers the way just the way that 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 syncopated rhythm that he does there is just like it's a kind of it's a kind of genius that I know he's not aware of because he's. Frankly, I don't think able to do it he's anymore. He's like 24 after. at this point, he's like 24, 20, yeah. 25. He doesn't know 20, shit. Yeah. He doesn't know anything. I mean, my God, I said that to my brother the other day. I was listening to Ride the Lightning, which I love. And I was like, they were 21. I'm just like, God damn it. What am I doing with my life? Um, anyway, this is also the song that always skipped on the CD that I got. So every time I hear it, I still start to get nervous. Yeah, I, that, 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 like, I grew up on cassettes, and we would always have like the one spot where we paused it for too long. Yep. And so we'd like, like, there was on a Van Halen fuck. I forget what song it was. But every time that song would come, I, my, my best friend who loved, loved Van Halen would go, Bleep. because every time we would always hear, Bleep. so he would always have to sing it. The less you have to hear from Sammy Hagar, the better. Uh, no, I'm will, seeing him I in told, two weeks. I'm so sorry. I told, I'm sorry for myself. I'm thrilled. I have to hear about it. I'm not happy. You, I, I, oh no, we're doing track by track of the concert. We're gonna be we're gonna do a chaser on it. Now it's a chase. Terrible. <laughs> terrible. Um, I will say that Harvester of Sorrow, along with Nick's other favorite Metallica song, "Wherever I May Roam," were the two biggest you, crowd reactions. Do, 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 do. 
the two biggest crowd reactions of Woodstock 94 and Metallica set were the Harvester of Sorrow and uh, that pause. Okay, that's that mullet James moment. Hetfield era. We don't, we don't, we don't recognize we mullet love that. James Hetfield. We love the cowardly lion James Hetfield era. No, it's mullet. He had a full-on mullet on that show. And he do was not, picking on Jason recognize. for cutting his hair. Yeah, Jason went, like, he went bald. In uh, the Live Ship Midget Purge box set, which I have, there is a poster of Jason where it says, Wherever I Go Dome. Oh, I actually had that when I was a kid. I had the, the VHS ones. Yeah, I still got it. I had to hide uh, it in my closet because it said shit on it, and I didn't want my parents to see it. Oh, yeah, my parents. My The one thing my father did that I can really say that that son of a bitch got right was he's like, I'll never try to censor what you listen to because you're just going to listen to it anyway. He's correct. He did not, however, hear me listening to Easy E. That my parents also did not hear that, or or you know, uh, uh, what was it? Um, Digital Underground. Or I have that on vinyl. I got a Swedish too, copy. Too short. Uh, the conversation may have been very different had he heard Easy E. Yeah, just, just gonna say. Uh, moving on to the flaw, Freight ends of sanity. Here is a great three minute song that they played for another five minutes. Yeah, it's where it's where um, I start to hear post Justice Metallica a little bit, and it becomes a a, a little bit to me. This I'm is just... where the struggle within came from. They quote this song in the struggle within. Yeah, it's this is where I start to go. No, 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 no. Hold on for two more songs. Just hold on for two more songs. And luckily they do. They stick the landing. They're like Carrie Strug. They broke their ankle, but they landed the fucking bolt. Patriotism, I, y'all. I, I also feel like uh, is not Sweating Bullets a little bit of a ripoff of this song lyrically? Oh, like, my God. Okay. We do not recognize Countdown Mustang. to Extinction on this podcast. Oh, we do. Come on. Get out oh, of here. Oh, I love Countdown to Extinction. What's wrong with you? Something, you, something happened to you. Wrong with me is I played is, goalie. I was a, Nick, a hockey goalie, just, and I got hit in the head a lot. That's got to be it, it's, I assume. It's starting to show up lately a lot on this podcast. Like, Nick is just throwing <laughs> out bold statements that have no value. And it's the first time in my friendship with him that I'm very saddened a lot now. But anyway, hopefully you'll get it back together. I don't know what's going on in your life. You need some help. Uh, pursue that therapy. We I'm going into earlier. therapy next month. Can we flip the record now? Let's flip uh, it. Sure. Side D or four, I don't know how it's listed. Now we get to Live Is To Die, a, the only Cliff Burton writing credit which has his vocal or has his lyrics. Lyric. His lyrics are a little... I don't want to speak ill of Cliff, but it's a little bad. It's it's like It, it sounds like me in high school trying to write these really deep poems. And yeah. I look at them now and went, wow, you're writing about your scrunchies. You just don't have any life experience to draw on. And Why were you writing about scrunchies? I, I was actually referencing Glee. Oh, okay. That, that was referential humor. Why are you movie. referencing Glee? No, I'm just sorry. Uh, because Lawyer Wife made me watch it. We used to only have <laughs> one television, and she yeah. would watch Glee. It's meh. Yeah, it was terrible. I'd, I'd rather watch Saved by the Bell or California Dreams, but I'm a Peter Engel stan. What can I say? Wow, we are referencing some weird shit this week. You are, you might be banned, Quinn. I'm, I mean, the, I'm the catalyst. I, I am. I mean, this is this is I'm great, patient, but it's it's I'm great, but it's like weird. Weird references. Yeah. It's, no, it's it, it's weirder than usual. Oh my god! Uh, somebody talk. Uh, I can hear my family. So here's what I'm going to do. Watch this. Woo-hoo. I'm going to take you guys with me. This it's like is a zombie impressive. movie. It's impressive. Yeah, this is like 28 days later, except for the Dog. podcast. Ah. Is this Shaun of the Dead? Are we in Shaun of the Dead? I'd rather be in Shaun of the Dead. You got a little red on you. <laughs> He's not my dad. He's my stepdad. Dogs can't look up. All right. <clears throat> but dogs can there. look up. Dogs can look up. I Go love to it. the pub. Save Liz. Right. Back to the Winchester. <laughs> oh, I love those movies. I loved all of those movies, actually. Um, to live is to die. Yeah, you know, it, like I said, it, I think it's, I think it's beautiful. I think absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, th- you know, it's funny. I've never really, I've never really thought about the quality of the lyrics, just because it's like, I, I felt like, pleasure. yeah, I felt like with this one, they were trying to reimagine Orion, mm. and it just didn't get there. Which you don't care for because you don't like live uh, instrumentals. I hear. No, I love instrumentals on records. You don't like them live. Correct. That's just weird. 
doesn't work for me. I get that. You know what? It's only because time... they played three in one show recently, which we were not at. Thank God. I don't need 45 minutes of instrumental Metallica. Yeah, no. I mean? I, I, That's a I lot. That's a lot. It. I also sort of feel like um, I don't. That doesn't I, even include the stupid ass doodle, which they insulted us in St. Louis. Like, oh, we called it Chile Rieno last night, but nobody in St. Louis knows what that is. Go to Little Mexico, you motherfucker. It's right there on Cherokee. It's half a block from where we're sitting, and you can get the best Chile Rienos. Go to the Esquina de Sabor. Sorry. But he did say the next night, oh, I'll be damned. You guys do have Mexican food in St. Louis. Bro, it's 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 America. We all yeah, have it. We all have Mexican food. We've had Mexican food forever. It's not new. I it's, mean, it's... we also here's a new thing we have in St. Louis in our little Italy neighborhood, the last little Italy. We have Italian food too, god damn it. Did you know? I mean now sorry, go ahead. No, I'm gonna just piss myself. I'm I have to pee and I'm just gonna piss myself if I get this upset about the stupid crap that doesn't matter. <laughs> So are you guys, do you guys, are you fans of, because there seems to be a dividing line on Dyer's Eve. Well, I I'll love just, Dyer's I'll, Eve. I'll just jump in and say that I have always loved to live is to die and I don't care oh. about the poetry. It's Cliff's words and he's dead. So I liked it. And um, it was, it's long. I think I would say like this entire record is every song is a probably a 10 except the yep. last three and dyer's eve is a nine freight into sandy he's like a seven to live is to die is an eight or a seven. i would say dyer's eve is a 10. dyer's eve has got that great again here they're doing they're redoing damage ink even with the same letter to begin with damage ink dyer's eve same number of syllables same it's same cadence same everything but now he hates his parents and you know what i'm hearing this i'm 15. i'm 15 years old and what do i hate more than anything at 15. My Your parents. parents. You know what? Uh, uh, well, and his were particularly noxious. Oh yeah, I mean they were awful. Um, yeah, awful, awful. And uh, but also the sorrow in it. You know that that's like you know no matter what, they're still your parents, and they're still yeah. that. I wish, I wish this would have been better. See, I, I think I, I think I agree with you, Nick. I think, I think it is. I think it goes seven, eight, and then ten. I think Dyer's Eve is absolutely brilliant, and yeah. I think it is the great version of some of the therapy rock that they got into later, you know? So yeah, like this this could have been on St. Anger if St. Anger were really great. Although I will say, and I'll die on this hill, the songs on St. Anger are amazingly well-written and recorded like idiots. Yeah. I, nobody, agrees, nobody agrees with me, and that's fine. I don't care. It doesn't the have album anything is not sharper. I don't have anything sharper on my desk than a scissor. If you need something for, sharper, something I got an image, image for you. Shut up, I, you. Shepherd image. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I'm not a fan of, uh, oh, that's a fork, Keefe. Stop it. I'm not a fan of, uh, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do that, at least talk while you do it so we see you pop your eyeball out. I mean, let's get the content, let's get the, let's get the views. Uh, Charlie M, you made me pop your eyeball out for Charlie M. (laughs) Okay, let's finish this. Let's, let's come on, let's, let's, let's get this pig skinned. Dyer's Eve. Go. Ten ten. Dyer's, ten ten. Dyer's Eve rules. It's, Dyer's it's Eve rules. Right. And, and we've discussed previously, on like, they always wrote the last song on the album was usually one of the last songs they wrote, not just mm. sequenced. And it's usually the indicator of where they're trying to go next. James has said this, Lars has said this especially. So you can kind of, without, if you took the speed away from Dyer's Eve and made it like a mid-tempo ACDC song, you would have Sad But True, or you would have... Yeah, you know, you would have. How's the uh, jack belt? A my bitch. Yeah. I mean, this this could have been on any record going I forward. I guess, but it, it, except yeah, um, it, I could see it. I was trying not. I was trying to say I think it is the the perfected version of that. But then I started to say something awful about their later work, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> this is the song that would have made all their next albums better. Yeah. Uh, um, with that, I right, will in say, the, yeah. In the interest of time, yeah. Let's Matt, let's, fin- uh, let's get let's let's get in this. Quinn, cat. Quinn, thank you for, for hey, being here. And oh, we're not going to give a rating on this. I was going to maybe give... we are in a second. Maybe oh, we'll, okay, okay. We'll okay. be less we'll be less crappy in the next one. I don't know why you we're guys, so off the rails. Today. That was that was fantastic. No, no, no. Listen, good podcasts are good conversations, and when they happen between good friends, they're the best. Because Thank you. Because you're a good podcast, like I was listening to yours earlier today and a couple weeks ago, and thinking, it, you know, when it's a good conversation, you want to be in that room, and you, you're excited. That's what a good podcast is. And today, 
I fucking got to be in the room. So thank you guys. This was wonderful. Thank you for, thank you for oh, coming in. You got nice. to come. You, and you're all, you're now a friend of the show. You're welcome back anytime. All right, appreciate it. And, Not next uh, week though. Next week's different. <laughs> Oh, are, we doing, on... are we doing all the ad records today or next week? The, next the week. Total of... next, next week. week. Okay. I'm going to come back so, when you guys do St. Anger, but I'm not going to listen to St. Anger, and I'm just going to make up all my thoughts. So, so oh, that's even thing. better. If you want to do St. Anger, here's what you got to do, Quinn. you got to talk to this guy without me, and you got to convince him I will do the later Metallica records as another series, but Ooh. I will not ever know. No, that's a deal breaker. I won't do it. Then we can't do it. That's four records. Or you, or you can do it. No, I will not do Lulu. You can do it without me. I gotta pee. Listen, I will do one Lou. I won't do both no. Lou's. I'll do no. one Lou. Somebody okay, we'll do it okay, so where so we I, only it, listen my, to the left channel. That's one Lou. It, All right, there you go. We won't listen to the right is channel. My, is it my turn, turn to close it down? Uh, uh, could be. Could be. It can, it can be right. yours. All right, then you, not Lou, but you, you, you have been listening to the Glacially Musical Podcast. They, ghostcultmagazine.com joint or ghostcultmag.com joint uh, thank you so much to our beloved guest for being here today we'll link all your stuff in the description feel free to shoot me an email with all the deets I'll make sure everybody follows you I will follow you and be a fan forever now and uh, as we say every week at the Glacially Musical podcast it does not play in Peoria but Metallica undoubtedly has played Dyer's Eve there at least once just for the record, all those times I said Rocky Hockey is coaching in Peoria, that's actually not true. Rocky Hockey is coaching in the NHL, and I apologize. Rocky Hockey. <laughs>